So this paper is joint work with uh, Pat Klein and Danny Yegan. And so governments around the world make uh, widespread use of uh, place-based policies. Um, so for instance, in Europe, about a third of the budget is actually dedicated to regional policy and shifts budget around from richer areas like Germany uh, to poorer areas like uh, Southern Italy, for instance. And there are typically two rationales given uh, uh, for these uh, place-based policies or these types of interventions. The first one is an efficiency rationale. Uh, these place-based policies uh, help internalize agglomeration or congestion externalities or help do a big push towards a more efficient equilibrium for the economy. Um, and there's a, another very different type of rationale for this type of policies, which is purely for equity reasons. Because when you think about it, places are very heterogeneous in their incomes, in the opportunities they offer, in the environment they, they provide. And therefore, those place-based transfers are a way to transfer resources to the disadvantaged. And so that's the focus of our paper today. We want to kind of evaluate the extent to which it makes sense to use place-based policies for this type of redistributive question. And uh, in contrast, the bulk of the literature has studied this uh, former kind of efficiency motive for place-based redistribution. So um, there's a clear motivation uh, for using uh, a, you know, place as a, as a, uh, to index redistribution. Uh, let me come back to full screen. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Uh, but so a clear reason why you would want to use place is that poverty is spatially concentrated. Uh, so here I'm taking just an example, but it's true at various levels of, of geographic aggregation. Here I'm taking the example of Chicago. And you can see that uh, in the west side and the south side of Chicago, uh, poverty rates are, uh, poverty is super concentrated and poverty rates are around 50%. And typically place-based uh, policies target this type of very poor areas. And just to give you an example, uh, in the US, the Empowerment Zones Program, uh, which is in, was put in place in 1993, uh, typically targets this type of very poor tracts. Uh, it covers about 1% of the US population, uh, and eligible workers uh, get about $3,000 uh, of transfer. So, okay, uh, there are some equity gains, obviously, uh, to transfer resources to these areas. But uh, one may legitimately you know, argue that uh, we already redistribute to those places based on income only. So through the income tax system, the progressive income tax system, uh, as well as other income-based transfers. So you see here uh, in Chicago, uh, we're representing here the share of uh, income tax filers who can claim the EITC and therefore have a negative income tax, be net recipients of the income tax system. And so about half of filers in the west and the south side of Chicago benefit uh, our net recipients uh, of the income tax. And so really the question we're asking in this paper is uh, should south side residents get an extra transfer because they reside uh, in, uh, so in the south side? And the traditional answer to this question is uh, no, they shouldn't uh, because of efficiency cost. And this, is, this view is summarized here uh, in this quote uh, by Ed Glazer, who writes, help, people, help poor people, not poor places, is something of a mantra for many urban economists. Place-based aid is inefficient because it increases economic activity in less productive places and decreases economic activity in more productive places. So in this paper, we're going to kind of uh, re-evaluate uh, the, the validity or, or we're going to re-evaluate the desirability of using place as a redistribution tool because we're going to argue that in practice, all forms of redistribution are distortionary. So place-based redistribution distorts location choices, but income-based redistribution distorts labor supply choices. And so really the question we want to ask in this paper is, uh, does using place as an index for redistribution help improve the equity efficiency trade-off we face as a society when we want to redistribute? And we're gonna find that uh, place uh, is act can be actually uh, used as a useful complement uh, to income-based redistribution for two main classes of reasons. 
The first one is that it may lead to lower efficiency cost of taxation. And that's going to happen when there is limited mobility or limited earnings losses from people uh, who move. Um, and second, using place uh, and using place based redistribution can lead to unique equity gains that income based redistribution cannot achieve. And that's going to be the case when the planner wants to redistribute across places within earnings. For instance, the planner may want to subsidize families of the same income, but families who live in a very uh, in crime infested neighborhoods, for instance. And then at the end of the paper, what we're going to do is we're going to put together all of these arguments and then run a quantification exercise where we're going to try to gauge how large may be the optimal transfer um, that we want to make to the people who live in the poorest areas of the US. And we're going to find, so we could have found that it was zero if all that's, that is needed is really just using the income tax. But actually, we find quite a large uh, result, which is about uh, $5,000 per household uh, who live in those 1% uh, poorest uh, areas. So here is the conceptual framework that we're going to use. We're going to write down a uh, number per year or what is this? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, per year, sorry, per year. And so it's, it's going to, it's for 1% of the population. Okay, just to fix ideas. Thanks. Thanks. So the model is going to uh, have elements from uh, an urban model and elements from a public finance model. OK, and so households are going to be heterogeneous in their skill theta. But crucially, that skill is not going to be observed by the planner. Rather, uh, households are going to choose how much effort to exert and, and so what income they're going to get. And that income is going to be observed by the planner and it can be taxed. And that's going to lead to labor supply distortion. And then households are also heterogeneous in their preferences for location. Again, those are not going to be observed, but they're going to lead to residential choices. Those residential choices are going to be observed and can be taxed. Now, just a caveat, two things are, that are not in the analysis I'm going to show you today. One is we're going to have an, an, an equilibrium that's efficient. We're not going to model market failures. And that's because, again, the efficiency motive for place-based transfers has been already studied in detail. So we want to shift the focus towards the other motive, which is an equity motive. Uh, and second, we're not going to be talking in the presentation about the incidence of these taxes on landowners, but that's something that's in the paper. OK. so. Um, we're going to consider a world where you have a unit mass of household characterized by their skill and their preferences for location. Their utility, so they're going to derive utility from the consumption of a traded good, the consumption of housing. They're going to derive utility from the level of amenity or the quality of life of the region where they live, which is AJ. J is going to index where they live. And finally, they're going to have a disutility of labor. And so how much effort they exert is this component here, which is their income divided by the wage rate they can have access to, which is a function of their skill theta and the location where they are, because cities can be differentially productive. And then households are also going to draw an idiosyncratic preference shock for the various location. Uh, that's uh, this epsilon here. So we're going to have a simple model with two locations uh, that we're going to call elsewhere and distressed. Location one is going to be the one we call distressed as a mnemonic because it's going to be the place towards which we want to see whether it makes sense to uh, redistribute. Those locations are going to differ in three dimensions. First, amenities. Distressed is going to have lower amenities, lower quality of life than elsewhere. Rents are going to be lower in distress, so life is going to be cheaper there. And then productivity may be lower in distress. And the way we're going to capture that is that we're going to say that at every skill level, a household is going to have access to a lower wage in distress than in elsewhere. So households are going to Sorry, choose- this is, a, um, this is a exogenously given the fact that the wage uh, is uh, lower in distress yeah. area or you as a general equilibrium? No, it's, no it's, going to be, it's going to be exogenous. It's a, you're going to see it's a almost, I mean, despite the fact that it's a macro conference, 
it's going to be very partial equilibrium. Let me say that. Uh, I just understand. Yep. <laughs> Um, and so they're going to make their decision of where to live subject to the budget constraint, which is standard, except that I want to stress that people get their income Z and then they are going to be taxed depending on how much they make and depending on perhaps where they live. So we have a utilitarian planner, okay, that's going to maximize a social welfare function that simply aggregates indirect utility of all households, perhaps with Pareto weights that are flexible. Um, so this is the social welfare function. And so it's going to be useful to define the following object. We're going to call lambda the social marginal welfare weight. So lambda for a household theta measures the welfare benefit of giving an additional dollar to that household. So, and that's directly derived from the social welfare function. So high lambda household are those towards which the planner would want to redistribute more. And so what redistributive tools does the planner have? Well, on the one hand, she has an income tax, T of Z, that's going to be the same in both places. So it's going to be place blind and it can be nonlinear and it can be whatever we want. And then the question we're going to ask is on top of this place blind income tax, uh, does the planner want to put in place a place-based redistribution scheme? And we're going to study one that's very simple. It's going to be lump sum. We're going to Tax, we're going to sorry subsidize uh, all residents of distressed with a lump sum transfer indexed by delta. So it's going to be delta divided by S, where S is the share of household in distress. And this lump sum transfer is going to be financed by a lump sum tax uh, on uh, elsewhere residents. And we're going to look at what happens for a small delta, and we're going to ask what is the first order welfare effect of implementing a small PBR, so place-based redistribution. PBR reform starting from a place blind system. And so the first result is well, that's the welfare effect of implementing a PBR. And so if it's positive, then uh, you want to uh, implement it. So what is this welfare effect? Well, it has two terms. The first term here is the equity gain of putting in place the PBR. Um, so basically, it's going to be positive. If, uh, I mean, basically, it's the difference between the average welfare weight of people who live in distress and the average welfare weight of people who live in elsewhere. So to the extent that there is some sorting going on and people who live in distress have this higher welfare weight, this higher marginal utility of income, then the, it's going to make sense from an equity perspective to redistribute and to put in place a, a, a place-based redistribution scheme. But then, of course, this equity gain doesn't come for free. Um, there's an efficiency cost. Um, and what is the efficiency cost of putting in place this PBR? Well, it's going to be coming from people who move and lose earnings upon moving because they move to this, they are attracted by this subsidy that subsidizes the low productivity area. And so this efficiency cost is going to be um, proportional to the number of movers in response to the uh, reform. Uh, times uh, what are the fiscal losses incurred because that person moves and loses income upon moving. So ultimately, uh, again, whether this is positive or not depends on cases, but I'm going to show you a few examples in which, un arguably stylized examples, uh, but in which this whole term is actually zero. So there's no efficiency cost of implementing a PBR, and therefore, so long as there is sorting, uh, you're going to want to put it in place. So here is the first very stylized example. We're going to specialize the model into the model of one city where the two locations are two residential neighborhoods, perfectly symmetric geographically around a central business district where people work. And then if you put in place a transfer between the affluent and the poor neighborhoods, maybe some people are going to move to the poor neighborhoods to capture this subsidy, but they're not going to change their access to jobs by doing so. So there's not going to be earnings losses upon moving, hence no efficiency cost of the program. A second example is very different, is one that thinks about the fact that there are high moving costs that have been estimated in the literature. And so in this model, in this version of the model, rather, in this interpretation of the model, we're not going to be thinking that people live in distress because they have a high preference for distress. Rather, we're going to assume that the utility in distress is always for everybody lower than in elsewhere, 
but people have a moving cost uh, to pay if they want to move. And that moving cost is too high for people to move from distress to elsewhere. So in that world, even if you subsidize distress a little bit, it's never going to encourage anyone to move from elsewhere to distress because the utility gap is too high. And therefore, again, when you put in place this subsidy, it's not going to uh, lead to any move. And so there's going to be no efficiency cost. And finally, a third very, again, different example comes from this notion that uh, good jobs or high skilled jobs are more and more clustered in, in big and booming cities. Um, and so we're going to think about that in a very stylized model where you're going to have in elsewhere, only in elsewhere, you're going to have high skill, high wage jobs. And in both areas, in elsewhere and in distress, you're going to find low skilled jobs at the same wage rate for simplicity. So in that world, if you subsidize distress, you're not going to attract the high skilled workers. You're only going to attract low skilled jobs and they have the same earnings in the two areas. So because there's no earnings losses of movers, there's again no efficiency cost of a PBR. So arguably those examples are very stylized, but uh, they convey the notion that uh, PBR is likely to be uh, something that leads to some equity gains and perhaps at not too big efficiency costs um, to the extent that you know, some of these uh, uh, examples um, are uh, to some extent true. Um, now, you know, and, and up until now, we've been thinking about whether, given a, 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 an income tax system, whether or not you want to, in addition, use place for a distribution. But if you think about it, uh, maybe it's desirable to add this little PBR reform on top of uh, the tax system. But maybe an income tax reform uh, could dominate this place-based reform. So, um, so here, what we want to do is uh, establish a stringer uh, condition uh, in which we're going to really ask whether or not uh, a PBR is desirable, even if the income tax itself had been optimally chosen. And so to do that, we're going to compare PBR to an income tax reform that raises the same tax at each earning level. And we show that PBR is going to be a useful complement to place blind redistribution, even if it is optimally chosen, if uh, the difference in equity benefits between the place-based and the income-based uh, systems, net of the difference in efficiency costs between those two reforms uh, is positive. And so I'm going to walk you through this difference first in equity benefits between a place-based reform and an, income an equivalent income tax reform. So remember that in isolation, we've seen that the equity gain of a place-based re uh, reform depends on whether uh, welfare weights are higher on average uh, in distress than in elsewhere. Now, when you compare that to an income tax reform, it turns out that an income tax reform can take care of a cross earnings redistribution. And therefore, what's left for PBR in a way, or the unique equity gains that PBR can trigger, are if they are within earnings uh, motive for redistribution. That is, if for a given level of income, welfare weights uh, tend to be higher in distress than in elsewhere. And so, you know, in general, in public finance, this kind of redistributing motive within income, this horizontal uh, redistribution is not really something that people uh, like to, to consider, but we were gonna argue that in the case of place, uh, it may very well make sense uh, uh, that um, you know, people have a higher marginal utility of income in uh, uh, distress, for instance, that, than in elsewhere, even if they have exactly the same income. So that's a motive for a distribution uh, from, a dis from elsewhere to distress. So what are the micro foundations or what are possible rationales for this within earnings redistributive motive? Well, the first reason is that prices are different in elsewhere and in distress. And if utility functions, we show in the paper that if utility functions are not too concave, what's going to happen is that a government dollar that's spent in distress in the place where prices are low is going to buy more consumption. So it's going to go further there because prices are lower. And so this tilts uh, the welfare weights uh, into being higher in distress than in elsewhere. 
A second thing that could happen is that, uh, recall that amenities are lower in distress. And, you know, again, depending on properties of the utility function, it can be that those disamenities raise the marginal utility of consumption. And then again, in this case, it means that welfare weights are higher in distress. You want to redistribute towards distress, even within income. What are examples of such disamenities? Well, one thing you can think of is uh, areas where there's a lot of crime. In those areas, a poor family may want to spend more on, say, car rides or Uber rides to drive the kids safely back home rather than letting them walk, for instance. And when you look at uh, crime rates, you see that here in Chicago, they are concentrated is, you know, in those tracks that are also the poor tracks. Um, so, another... Cecile, uh, you have around four minutes left. Oh, I do, okay. Um, so another example is pollution. Uh, poorer tracts also tend to be uh, high pollution tracts. And again, you can think that high pollution leads to healthcare needs and so increases the marginal utility of consumption. So we don't know much uh, ultimately uh, about uh, whether or not people have these social preferences for redistributing uh, between places uh, for the same level of earnings. And so to get more uh, information on that, what we did is actually uh, run a survey of uh, 1,000 Americans using the Amazon uh, MTORC platform to try and elicit social preferences uh, for this within earnings across place redistribution. And so we asked people what they preferred, and we find that um, about half of the people that we uh, uh, surveyed prefer to give uh, a tax credit to poor families who live in distressed areas, rather than giving a tax credit to equally poor families who either live in rich areas or who live everywhere. And so this suggests that social preferences uh, uh, may indeed align with this notion that you want to redistribute to distressed areas. So whether or not you want to put in place a place-based redistribution scheme, even in the presence of an optimal income tax, it depends on those equity benefits that I've been talking about for a bit too long. And it also depends, we show in the paper, on the difference between the efficiency cost of uh, income tax versus a place-based tax. So this is this term. Um, basically, the intuition is that net efficiency costs of place-based redistribution are going to be low if migration rates are limited, earnings losses of movers are limited, or if the cost of the income tax is high, uh, which happens when labor supply responses are large. So ultimately, the desirability of place-based redistribution is a horse race. It depends on, the, on this inequality. And so what we're going to finally do in the paper is a quantification exercise that asks how large might those optimal transfers be uh, in the empirical context of the US. And so we're going to basically calibrate the model and compute the optimal transfer scheme to the 1% of people who live in the poorest groups of tracts in the US. So we're going to group we're going to look at uh, the US as an amalgamation of 100 communities. Each community is a set of tracts uh, that are ranked by uh, their level of poverty. And we're going to redistribute to this poorest set of tracts. Um, so we're going to compute um, uh, numerically what's the optimal income tax that the planner wants to put in place, and also this optimal transfer to these poor areas. We're going to you know, have to take a stance on the shape of the utility function. This looks terrible and ugly, but actually it's a very simple function because you have constant migration elasticity, constant labor supply elasticity, constant share of spending on housing, and uh, some it allows for complement for a skill test correlation, that is that the high skill value, high amenities more than the low skill, which is consistent with the research by Rebecca Diamond, for instance. And so we're going to calibrate this, uh, this model, borrowing parameters from the literature, and also matching uh, the rents in each community that we read from the census, uh, and the distribution of uh, earnings and population across all of these communities in the US. So we match, we calibrate the model, we match those moments, and then we compute the optimal uh, income tax, and on top of it, whether or not there is an optimal level of transfer to this poorest 1% of people who live in these, uh, in these poor tracts. And we find that this optimal level of transfer is about $5,000 per, per year. 
putting that in place compared to not using PBR allows to reduce the difference between welfare weights in those poor areas and the rest of the country by 71%. So basically it alleviates poverty in those very, very uh, poor uh, areas. Now, more people are gonna move into these areas. They're gonna grow from 1% of the population to 1.1% of the population of the US. Um, so you're out of time, so maybe you want to wrap up. My last slide. So we do other robustness and I spare you that. Let me conclude. So um, we show in the paper that place-based redistribution can deliver unique equity benefits as well as efficiency benefits. And so overall, it can help kind of enhance the effici uh, equity efficiency trade-off that we face as a society when we want to redistribute. And so we conclude that there should be no presumption against helping uh, poor places. Sorry for going over time and thank you. So, uh, yeah, so this, is, this was a very interesting and thought provoking paper. And yeah, but it's not something that I'm, an area that I'm very familiar with. So I'm going to uh, keep my discussion pretty broad. Um, okay, so as uh, Cecile said, most work on place-based policies to date has focused on the production side. So the idea has been to subsidize firms to move to particular areas. And the motivation is to move jobs to where people need work or need better paying work. And it's kind of rationalized by high moving costs for households. But the, the, most of the things, the programs we've seen in place are on the production side. And this paper takes an entirely new tack focusing on uh, the consumption side, uh, redistribution. And the idea is to subsidize households in low income areas, um, transferring income the way a Marlesian income tax does, and just rationalized by utilitarian motive to uh, make the distribution of income more equal. And so the question is when is, when are, place-based policies a useful uh, complement to a progressive tax. Um, okay, Cecile described the main results pretty clearly. So um, let me just repeat, the, the main uh, results are that optimal subsidies to distressed areas are larger when less skilled households are very concentrated in the distressed area. Uh, when few households are close to indifferent about where they live. So a policy, a place-based policy is not going to cause a lot of change in location. When product difference, productivity differences between the two types of areas are small, so there's not much efficiency loss on that dimension. And then there are issues about the marginal utility of consumption. You know, this, uh, my point four is just from the introduction and I, of the paper, and I found uh, this claim rather confusing because to me, if marginal utility, if, if people have symmetric preferences, then marginal utility, uh, if it doesn't decline with income, then it's going to be the same across people. So there's no point in moving income. So she has in mind something different. Okay, so I wanna start with just going back to the kind of ethical underpinnings for a progressive tax system. So uh, a Merlesian tax and the ethical, you know, the ethical foundation is to think about a Rawlsian choice behind the veil of ignorance. So individuals differ in their uh, productive uh, ability, their wage, theta, um, they have identical tastes and tastes in merely are just over consumption and leisure. And the optimal tax system maximizes ex ante expected utility given the distribution of productive ability. So the idea is this, this is something that would get unanimous, uh, you know, uh, support if people had to choose a tax system before they knew their, their own productivity and it provides the optimal feasible level of insurance given the informational constraints. 
So the main idea is, here is very similar, except that individuals differ in three parameters. In addition to theta, we have uh, two epsilons, and they can be interpreted as either tastes or moving costs, depending on whether they enter the utility function or the um, budget constraint. Um, uh, to me, like from the Merlesian perspective, interpreting these as moving costs is a preferable inter interpretation. And like to me, the ethical underpinnings for insuring people against taste shocks are just much weaker than for insuring against ability shocks. Um, just we, we are on much slippier ground when we talk about um, differences in tastes. Okay, so then we can ask, you know, suppose there are two areas, they differ in their wage rates. Individuals are assigned to initial locations. We can think about this as where they're born and there's a fixed cost of moving. And maybe the moving costs are different for going from zero to one or one to zero. And we can ask the question, can a place-based redistribution policy that uses the type of taxes and transfers Cecile described, improve on the allocation under an optimal um, Merlesian income tax? You know, the, the answer is yes, that's not surprising. Another instrument is always useful. So the more interesting question is, when is the improvement substantial? And, you know, as a macroeconomist, I'll say to me, you know, and I've said this to Cecile privately, you know, I think of the gain, the social gain is, I would want to use the equivalent income variation. So what uniform increase in consumption across all people would give the same increase in the social welfare function. Now, she pointed out to me her, you know, I had kind of not appreciated this fact. The, the, the policy they look at is very narrowly targeted to 1% of the population. So the, uh, the equivalent income variation is going to be pretty small. Um, you know, so I think if they're, uh, to, to make a case for this kind of reform, I would say there are two things. First of all, you have to, well, mainly you have to think about maybe expanding it, not just to 1%, but to, you know, a X percent group that um, is chosen somehow. It's, you know, the, I would say, if nothing else, the politic, there's going to be a lot of political resistance to making a $5,000 transfer to a tiny group chosen on the basis of where they live. Okay, and then lastly, I want to say that um, I think the impact of this paper might be greater if, um, they emphasized certain things and maybe even eliminated some things. The model here is pretty complicated. It has a lot of elements. And, you know, if it were my paper, I would just like clear some of them off the table. So uh, there are these amenities. So these are just, you know, kind of, it's like a variation in tastes across the two areas that let you, you know, kind of play with, it may it just give different utility functions to the two areas. Um, they, I would say, muddy the theoretical analysis. Um, I would eliminate housing as a special category and interpret high wage as relative to the local cost of living, where the cost of living includes housing. Um, and then for empirical work, depending on, you know, whether you think of these uh, redistributions as being across cities or within cities, if it's across cities or across countries, you can think of using city level or country level CPIs and then think about the wage relative to the local CPI. Um, I don't know if anything like the CPI is available at the zip code level. So if you're thinking about transfers within cities that might be a lot more complicated. Um, and in general, I would say just avoid differences in preferences across individuals as a basis, you know, a foundation for anything, because there's going to be much less agreement in the profession about that as a 
you know, the fundamental thing driving redistribution. And I would also avoid thinking about the preferences as elicited in a survey of the population as a whole as a justif justification for policy. Most people are incredibly ignorant about the economic consequences of policies. So I think we want to be sort of school marms telling them like, you know, maybe no, this is not what you want because you haven't thought about A, B, C, and D. You know, you only thought about Z. Um, but uh, it is, this is a very novel and interesting idea. The paper is very well executed and I recommend it. It's uh, interesting reading. Thank you. Uh, if there are any other questions, I think uh, Ise had a question. If you want to say it out, out loud and we'll collect a few more questions before uh, Cecile responds. Like this paper. Um, I was wondering, Cecile, if you, so I'm working on a paper on homelessness which also um, is making me look at the lowest 1% or even smaller uh, fraction of the people in the population. And I, I also find something similar to a place-based, location-based subsidy being more optimal. But I was wondering, in the data you looked at in Chicago, are those uh, areas uh, likely to be areas from which homelessness comes more than others. And then Elena Pastorino had another question. Uh, yes, I, I didn't follow from the discussion. Uh, the question about place-based redistribution vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Epiguvian income tax this schemes. I thought the U.S. is structured uh, within a federal and state government precisely for this reason. Uh, we have a lot of redistributions, perhaps not at the right geographical granular level, but there are two levers and layers at which redistribution intersects. So I was wondering whether your results are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a state level representations of subsidy um, or you, you are abstracting from, from what already exists. Okay, and the last one, Veronica wanted to ask a question. Yeah, Veronica, we cannot raise hands because we are hosts, so you just have to talk. <laughs> it happened to me before. <laughs> so, um, no, sorry, I, I just a clarification question. Um, I didn't follow exactly your main exercise. Uh, so when you say that uh, you uh, would say that uh, uh, you need, like, uh, you, the optimal thing to do would do it $5,000 uh, per household, uh, in the like bad neighborhood, uh, um, what are you doing with the income taxation? Are you keeping the income taxation uh, at the calibrated the value of the what is in the what you believe is in the U.S. or what? No, we compute the optimal one. We compute the optimal one. Uh, okay. So we see whether or not on top of that you would want to um, add the place-based redistribution. So, but the optimal one. Uh, uh, joint with the assuming yeah, that yeah. no joint, 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 joint. kind of a complicated thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we do the two jointly. Sorry, there was one more question by Sydney, and then let's go to the answers after. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Cecile. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I was just wondering, do you have scope for considering in this paper um, this instead of just a, an income transfer to those who live in a certain area, the subsidi uh, subsidizing of um, the production of amenities, schools comes to mind, for example. Okay, if you want to now respond to everything. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, well, thank you, first of all, Nancy, uh, for, uh, you know, going through the paper and the great discussion. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, so let me, let me come back to some of the main points, uh, uh, Nancy, that you, that you mentioned. Um, so first of all, I, just, I, I agree that the survey results, we don't want to take them too, too literally. And actually our quantitative exercise doesn't take that into account. It only focuses on the reduction in efficiency cost of taxation um, that is gained when you use place-based redistribution, but we, build, we, we, we shut down any equity benefit from place-based redistribution compared to income-based redistribution. So it's just about uh, efficiency of taxation. Um, I appreciate your point on like, I, I understand this point about kind of not 
it's not great to have this heterogeneity in preferences. Uh, it's the way the literature usually uh, rationalizes why we see this really, um, you know, this variety of choice uh, of location. And, uh, and so that's where we started with. But uh, we can very well have the alternative interpretation, as you said, the cost interpretation, uh, and the results uh, go through. And so maybe, maybe that, should be, that should be our baseline or the way we talk about things. Uh, I just want also to say that the actual value of those preference shocks don't enter our results at all. The only reason why those shocks enter our results is because they lead to a given location choice. But the value of the shock, which is impossible to estimate, does not uh, impact our results. So I, I just want to you know, minimize the importance of those, of those preference shocks in what we do. Um, in terms of the size, uh, of the program. It's true that the program we look at is, is rather narrow, it's rather small, and we, we only, sub, only subsidize kind of 1% of the population. But I want to say that, you know, what the paper is not doing uh, is, you know, finding kind of what is the, what would be the welfare gains of optimally uh, using place uh, uh, in our uh, redistributive system. Okay, what we do is just say that we should use place. I mean, we should. It would be well for improving to use place. And we then have a very, very simple program. It's lonesome, it targets one you know, slice of the population, but it could be much richer. We could imagine having something more complicated, and of course, having higher welfare effects. So I just wanted to, to, to say that. Um, um, so let's see, what should I say? Uh, yeah, we also talked about uh, the data and, and the, the, the uh, I mean, there were several questions about the level at which we do the analysis and the data that's necessary to do the analysis. So we do the analysis at the level of uh, tracts, so very small uh, within city type uh, uh, level, but we could also uh, do it at much aggregate, much more aggregate level. Um, at this very disaggregated level, it's actually useful to use housing and rents as an indicator of uh, the price. Uh, and so that's why we, we use rents um, and rents as reported uh, in the census to get a sense of how cheap or expensive these neighborhoods are. Uh, but to Elena's question, uh, we could uh, reiterate the same type of, um, of estimation in a model where we would capture more the state level or you know, redistribution between states or between MSAs. But for now, what we have in the baseline is really about this kind of very granular kind of track level redistribution because, I mean, in part because uh, actually some of the prominent programs in the US are of that sort. So again, the US empowerment zone system redistribute to tracts uh, or that are very small in some places uh, in, 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 in cities uh, um, and redistribute these things that actually look, you know, kind of like what, what we find, like a few thousand dollars per, per capita for, for people uh, who uh, work there. Um, and uh, what, what did I miss? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sydney, uh, you talked about, you know, whether an, another program that we could look at is rather than those cash transfers uh, would be more about subsidizing uh, productive amenities. I think it's clearly very important. But once you start to do that, because those tend to be public goods, you run into kind of this other motive for transfer, this kind of efficiency motive. And so we wanted to just separate the two and really think just about redistribution. So it's a bit narrow in that sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I take your point that thinking about uh, redistributing through uh, better amenities uh, is uh, clearly something uh, interesting in, in general. But again, we would hit kind of the other, the kind of the more Pigouvian motive there. And so um, we'd rather really isolate one channel. 